A wonderful but uh, simple and powerful prayer in that song. Certainly expressing the sentiments of all those who labor in the kingdom. If you would, please open your Bibles to the New Testament, to John chapter 18. And we'll be looking in a moment at 37 and 38. This is Jesus, of course, before Pilate, not long before he would suffer crucifixion. And reading verse 37, beginning, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? When he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them all, I find no fault at all. When Jesus is in this discussion, you might say interrogation with Pilate, you notice that he asserts very plainly and boldly to claim this claim that he is to bear witness and did bear witness unto the truth, verse 37. It's on the basis of that that we learn much about people then and people now, especially people in the positions that he was in. And he says, what is truth? We understand why so many people are in the mess that they're in when they take this view. I don't know what truth is. In our time, more and more people are like Pilate. Although there's always been many, there seem at times to be more than at other times. Now, you may not be familiar with the Barna, I think is where you say it, research group, but I've looked to them because they've done so much among uh, having to do with religion to do all sorts of surveys, get an idea of what people believe. And I went back and read some things from their page, and they've done different things over a period of time regarding uh, truth and what people believe about it, especially is there absolute truth. What do people think about that? Now, what they cited, a few years old, but they concluded after their surveys that 66% of adults responded that they believe that there's no such thing as absolute truth. Different people can define truth in conflicting ways and still be correct. 72% of those ages 18 to 25 years old express this belief. In a series of more than 20 interviews conducted at random at a large university, people were asked if there was such a thing as absolute truth. And by that, they mean truth that is true across all times and cultures for all people. All but one respondent, one respondent answered along these lines. All but one. Truth is whatever you believe. There is no absolute truth. I'm giving quotes. Is if there were such a thing as absolute truth, how can we know what it is? And then the fourth one was people who believe in absolute truth are dangerous. Again, you could go look that up online on uh, Barna Group. You may have to look through a lot of their stuff, but you'll find it interesting. You have to search for it for a while. Because when I went to the exact siding of this, it didn't give it right there. I had to look for this stuff, and I found out more than really what I was looking for. But anyway, this was, I thought, highly interesting. So I asked the question, what, and we talk a lot about this around here, so some of this is going to be familiar with some of you. But what is our perspective of truth? I think you'd be surprised if you just talked to your neighbors around you, just within a block, let's say. 
Is truth whatever you think it is? Is it possible for us to know absolute truth? You might say, well, that's, this is relatively new. Well, it's not. The year I, the last year I was at, actually where it was, at, at Harding, there was an English professor who was the chairman of the department, James Atterbury. And he was, what they did up there every year, they would go out to Camp Wildwood and they would have a faculty meeting to kick the year off before school started. And he read a paper. And in that paper, he declared that no man can arrive and know absolute truth. That all a person can do is just keep reaching toward it. Well, it uh, caused a big stir. Uh, Brother James Bales was in the midst of all of that at that time. And uh, eventually had to do with uh, Atterbury leaving. Number of teachers left, in fact, who were in sympathy with him because just the year before he had been given the Teacher of the Year Award. <laughs> and, uh, and he journeyed to Pepperdine and found a place more comfortable for him at that time in view of the fact that he thought you could just reach toward truth, you never could find it. But there were several who left. Well, that wasn't new with him in 1969. Of course, that's over 50 years ago. It? Neil Buffalo was a fellow who was in Arkansas at that time and had been involved with Harding and been kicked out because of theistic evolution in the early 60s. And Buffalo said at that time, oh, we still have people here or there since he was gone that was favorable to whatever it was of his view. So there's always been folks around, and the problem is the average member of the church, they don't know. You, you just don't know unless you get in the thick of it and dig in and find out, so you just don't know. And colleges aren't out, any institution of higher education, private or otherwise, they're not apt to just simply say, look, we're having all this trouble over this. <laughs> they're not apt to advertise it. But I'm saying all of that to say we've had problems with this business for a long, long time, and yes, even in the church, at least in certain places. So we need to understand what truth is, the nature of truth. I want to begin the study by simply noticing what I think most here already know, the two basic views of truth. The first one is that truth corresponds with reality. It's just what it is. And if you study philosophy, they're going to call this the correspondence view of truth. And it means simply a statement is true if and only if it corresponds to the facts in the case. So when you hear people saying, well, those aren't my facts, they're your facts, they don't know the first thing in the world about what a fact is. A fact is just what it is. And it doesn't care what you are. It doesn't care how old you are, whether you're wealthy, whether you're male or female, or you identify with a postal digger or whatever it is. It's just what it is. The correspondence view of truth then accepts what, when you study logic, this law in logic. The law of bivalence, the law of bivalence, any precisely stated proposition must be either true or false, so there's no middle ground. No middle ground whatsoever. It cannot neither be neither true or false. It cannot be neither, or if you like, neither. If it cannot be neither true or false, nor can it be both true and false. Um, the statement, I am standing in front of you. That's got to be either true or false. It cannot be both true and false. Now, somebody may say, yeah, but if I turn around and walk out, you're not standing in front of me. Well, you've changed the whole setup then. 
But I can say it this way. I'm standing in front of, and this is where you have to do propositions if you're interested in the truth. I'm standing in front of some of you. And it's always dangerous in making truth claim to say all or none. And when an atheist declares God does not exist, he can't really make that statement because that person is not in a position to make that statement. Because that means that he would have to be everywhere there's a place to be and know that God is not there. And he can't do that. But that's what he's affirming. The correspondence view of truth holds that propositional statements may be verified or falsified. I'm standing in front of you. Can that be verified? Could it be falsified? Well, certainly it could. The correspondence view of truth is simply saying, a statement can be proven false if it can be shown to disagree with objective reality. This is a teapot. Now, you see, you have to start defining terms. There's no use making a propositional statement if you don't define the terms of the proposition. So definitions are important. When we say a child's acting up, or maybe a wife will say that about her husband and said, you're a monkey. Well, you have to recognize that's a, that's a statement and it makes a claim. Proposition makes a claim, you see. And you say, you're a monkey. Well, the context is going to have to tell you you're acting like a monkey or surely you are not saying he's actually a monkey. But it all has to do with definition. It all has to do with definition. How would you understand any conversation with anybody if you don't define terms. The world is flat. Can that be falsified? Certainly it can be. A lot of folks used to believe it to be flat, but photographs from space have falsified flat earth claims. This view of truth was held if you study back far enough, and it doesn't take that long ago, by the vast majority of philosophers and theologians throughout history until recent years. That's the reason why I recommend a commentary, and I say it's an old commentary, maybe back into the 19th century or older, that I recommend those because they're starting with the basic premise that truth corresponds with reality. Some of these others don't. You, you, you really have to... And they won't come out in front and tell you either. So you have to know something about where they're coming from. But I would suggest that's the truth about anything. I don't know how laws or the legal profession, or for that matter, the making of contracts, which touches on all that. How would you make a contract with somebody without each party, party the first part, party the second part, <laughs> knowing what the terms of the contract meant? And that's why we joke about read the small print. The idea is be sure you've read whatever's necessary to understand what all's in that document. Make sure everybody's in agreement. So that's one view of truth. And I suggest to you today that that view of truth is falling on hard times. In the political world, in the academia, all around us. That's one reason the church, preaching an objective, absolute standard of truth that is the Bible, doesn't get too good a hearing. The other view is that truth is relative. It is not objective. It is not absolute. And we simply call that relativistic view. It means that what is true depends on the views of the people or cultures in which they reside. It depends on the views of the people or the culture in which they reside. It has nothing to do with whether statements correspond to objective reality. 
Now, if you will keep those things in mind and listen very closely to what a lot of people say in the news and what a lot of people do in politics, what a lot of people do in religion, what a lot of people do in philosophy, you'll understand that they hold this relativistic view of truth. For a statement to be true with these people means that a person or a culture thinks it's true. So you see, a while ago when I said this is a teapot, if I truly thought that, then it'd be a teapot. It might be a bird to you, but that's your truth. They, people that hold these views will say things like, well, that's true for you. And many times they do this because they may not know the terms that you would study and learn if you were really involved in academia and study this. Here's what they usually say if you present your view and it contradicts theirs. That's just your opinion. Everything to those folks is opinion. What is good is to ask the fellow that says, that's just your opinion. Would you tell me the meaning of opinion? Then they've got a problem themselves because I doubt some people... Uh, no, they probably say something like, well, that, well, that's just your view. Well, what do you mean by that? That's where we are today, brethren. And we're out there going to sit down and we'll study this book with them that's objective, absolute. And when they've got views like that, we need to understand that. doesn't mean we need to stop doing it. But it means we may have to start a lot earlier back than what we used to not that many years ago. Of course, other people are saying you can't judge other cultures. You can't judge other cultures. Well, the Nazis tried that, the Nuremberg trials. And they said, we're Germans, and we were under German law, which was the Nazi viewpoint of things at that time. And you sat over there in England and uh, the United States, and you judge us by the laws you had. And, of course, it was pointed out to them Ultimately and finally, there's a higher law from which all laws are derived. And of course, that'd be God. So I can judge other cultures. Let me show you one, a good illustration on that in the scriptures. When uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, or rather Titus. Now you know they're preaching an absolute objective standard of truth from God. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go you all over and preach the gospel to every creature. And then in verse 9 of Titus 1, Paul writing this young preacher, he says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And that's one of the qualifications to be a faithful elder or to be appointed an elder. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Now watch the next part. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Think about that for a minute. He just said, if you go into that culture, here's the way they've been taught. Here's the way you can expect the general average one of them to live. And if you're going to succeed in preaching an absolute standard of truth that is the gospel, you've got to know how to deal with them. Now, this is counter completely to the modern thought that we're talking about that says truth is relative and subjective. Paul says, when you go into a place, know, know the people. Know how they operate. Know from whence they are coming and the way they view things. Then give them the truth on it. Here it is. The Holy Spirit said so. He said it to a young preacher through the fine apostle. Does it teach us today? Is there a message in that that we need? Certainly it is. It absolutely is. There's a poet by the name of Steve Turner who wrote a parody of this attitude and called it Creed, C-R-E-E-D. 
Now, there's sarcasm here. He says, I believe that each man must find the truth that is right for him. Reality will adapt accordingly. The universe will readjust. History will alter. I believe that there is no absolute truth excepting the truth that there's no absolute truth. You see what he's saying? If you decide to erase the history of the South or the United States or what went on, and you erase all visages of it, it never happened. It never happened. It's not a part of our history. It's just not there. Well, does that change the facts? No, it doesn't. I'm glad to see there's some people writing that see through all this that are in various literary positions. When truth is thought to be determined by the person or culture holding the belief, you know what the outcome is. Anything can become true. Anything. One person can say, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is Lord of all. And another one can say, Buddha, Lord Buddha, he's the one we're to follow. Or, Allah is Lord. And they'll all be right. Everyone would be right. These statements will all be true if subjective relativism is true. Because there are people who really believe that. They really believe that. How would you ever say that Oswald, who assassinated Kennedy, was wrong. If he was sincerely believing that what he did was necessary and right, who is it to say that he's wrong? And really make it stick if the subjective relativistic view of truth is what is to be accepted. So this subjective view usually claims it's a step higher because it claims to advance tolerance and civility among people. It claims not to be judgmental. That's the worst thing you can be nowadays. But it does so at the expense of logic and intellectual sanity. And they're just as illogical as they can be. That's the reason I say they're insane intellectually. When a man can say there is no absolute objective truth, you know what you're going to ask him. Is that absolute? Now, a person that has gone so far off base that they would say that, and they really believe it, the very little you can do with it. It must be emphasized that those who say there's no absolute truth make decisions all day long, every day, based on things they believe are absolutely true or false. They do it all day long. They say one thing, but in practical life, they do right the opposite. They turn on a light, believing the reality of electricity. They drive a car, believing the effectiveness of the engine and all the rest of the things that make the thing run. And no one flying in a plane would want a navigator who did not believe in the absolute objectivity of the truth of his instruments. Wouldn't at all, as far as I know they would. Well, there may be some, but again, I say insanity is out there. No one undergoing surgery of any kind would want to be operated on by a surgeon who did not think that some things about the physical body are real and true and some things are not. <laughs> If there are no objective absolutes, there's no right or wrong. I can kill you. I can steal from you. I can lie to you. I, and nobody can say, you were wrong when you did that. Now, somebody was mentioning earlier today about Stalin. Well, of course, he was a Marxist-Leninist communist. 
he was an atheist. Now, when you take the position of being an atheist, there is no God, thus you're left to just what this world has to offer and what you can make out of it, and I promise you, you'll try to make it favor you. And when you get into a system that puts you into that frame of mind, that system must get the power to operate so you can be what you're going to be because all you've got right now, and then you're like a little dog rover, you're dead all over and you cease to exist. Those people many times aren't insane as we normally use the word insane. They're following their philosophy to its ultimate and logical conclusions, all they're doing. And thus, you have somebody like him and other communists killing people right and left. They have no problem with it. No problem whatsoever. If I think I should do such things as I just mentioned and accomplish them, then it works for me. Therefore, it's become my personal truth. And who are you to judge me to be wrong? Richard John Newhouse said this, and I quote, In the absence of truth, power is the only game in town. There it is. What makes any standard a standard in which all men must obey if there is no God and if truth is relative? Power. Power, that's all there is to it. Stalin knew that. Hitler knew that. And every other despot knew that. They became the standard of truth. When the Nazis came to power, the first thing they did, and the communists did the same thing, was shut down every avenue that could approach them and take their power away. They stopped all elections. They outlawed all political parties but their own. And you say, well, what's all that about? If you believe like these folks, you can't because if you get the power and become who they became, at least temporarily, then you're right. <laughs> Would you want to approach Stalin and say, you're wrong about what you're doing? Because what he believed. Again, what's that quote that he said about killing people? If it was the idea if he's a problem, kill the man, he's no problem. Why wouldn't you view that? Now, uh, think of the babies that have been killed in the womb. And think of the great position the, those people stand on. My body. Can't tell me what to do with my body. And you can point out to them till you're blue in the face, green in the face, your hair falls out and grows back in, that that child is not your body. And they'll get right back up there and look wise as a tree full of owls and say, you can't tell me what to do with my body. That's, in, that's intellectual insanity. It's dishonesty. That's where we are today in America. That's where we are. Despite its absurdity, the subjective relative view of truth has become the shining star for all who want to be free to do their own thing. That's where we are. But now, if you read your Bible, and you know it to be the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final revelation, the complete revelation of God to man, all Scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You know that, of course, is the correspondence view of truth. That's very clear. You're not going to be, as we said this morning, converted to Christ if you believe in subjective view of truth the relativistic view of truth. Look at some Greek words that will help us in understanding the biblical view of truth. The word true, T-R-U-E, in the Greek is alethes. It means unconcealed, manifest, actual, true to fact. So Vine says in his expository dictionary of New Testament words, 
Also, the word true, this word, I want to give you one word in Greek for true. This is another word for true. Alethanos. It denotes true in the sense of real, ideal, genuine. Greeks had a word for it, as the old saying goes. Then there's truth, C-R-U-T-H. Aletheia. Objectively signifying the reality lying at the basis of an appearance, the manifested veritable essence of a matter. You see the kin of every one of those. You see how they're connected. Always has to do with the correspondence of reality, correspondence view of truth. What truth is corresponds to reality. Subjectively, truthfulness, truth, not merely verbal, but sincerity and integrity of character. It all anchors in that way. That's the second definition for aletheia. Look at some biblical statements regarding truth. Now, one reason that I said last Wednesday night when I gave you all those scriptures supporting the Word of God and said this is sort of a preview of this sermon is because the truth of God concerning salvation and godly things is in His Word. God is a God of truth. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Jesus is the truth. He's the full truth. And He spoke the truth. John 14, 6. Chapter 1, verse 14 of John. And chapter 8, verse 45. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, is the Spirit of truth. And by the way, when He's talked about as the Spirit of truth, it primarily shows you what He did in revealing the mind of Christ, the truth that sets us free, the gospel. And He guided the apostles into all truth. John 14, 17, 16, verse 13. Then we see in John 17, 17, we said, Many thighs, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The judgments of God are according to truth. We touched on this on Wednesday night, Psalm 96, 13, and also Romans 2, verse 2. Christians are to walk in the truth as revealed by Jesus, including the standard of morality that he taught, Ephesians 4, 17 through 32, chapter 5, verses 1 through 17. Christians should patiently teach others the truth. 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 36 or 26. Now, let me ask you. When you're going to go out here and begin to teach other people the gospel because you love their souls, you want them to be saved, where do you think you ought to begin? You think it wouldn't hurt to have an early, early, early study on the nature of truth? To get an understanding, do they think truth is objective? Marilyn Monroe made the comment, she said, I... I believe in everything a little bit. You know, that describes a whole lot of folks, even in the church. I believe in everything a little bit. A fellow I mentioned to some of you I got into several months ago, when I told him that to be a Christian, you had to give your all to God and live like he taught. He said, well, I, I follow Christ to a certain extent. You think people don't need what, what we're talking about? They don't even know what they're saying or the implications in their own lives of what they're saying by the positions that they believe and hold. Now, of course, much more can be said as the Bible reveals so much about what truth is, and I urge you to study it from that standpoint. But we can sum it all up this way. What is truth? It's real. God's real, and it reveals what's real. God is truth, and what he says is the truth. And he, next, he never acts out of concert with it. And he expects us to approach life in the same way, based upon his truth. You can call yourself whatever you want to, but you cannot be a Christian the way that term is used in the New Testament and defined if you do not hold the correspondence view of truth. You must believe in moral absolutes of right and wrong. It's always wrong to lie, to murder, to steal, to commit fornication and adultery. Always, everywhere, every culture, it's always wrong. 
Now try that on some of your neighbors. Just ask them if they think it's always wrong to commit fornication. Hopefully they'd be honest enough to tell you really what they believed. You cannot be a Christian unless you accept Jesus and his word as the ultimate source of truth, especially in regards to morality and spiritual things, salvation. For those willing to accept Jesus as the ultimate source of truth, they will, of course, be greatly, greatly blessed. I'll end with what Jesus said in John 8, verses 31 through 36. You know most of it. John 8, 31 through 36. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Now mark it, they already believe on him. Did you get that? He's not saying this to people that have not believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And what's going to happen? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that's, if I could speak every language in the world, and I could say that in that language, whatever culture or society I'd be in, I'd say the same thing. And speaking through a translator I have in a number of places. Notice what we have in verse 33. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, whenever in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Uh, let me remind you, they were lying when they said that. They had been in bondage down in Egypt. They had been in bondage to the Greeks. They had been in bondage and were at that time, pretty much. They were not free to do as they pleased under the Romans. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily. Keep in mind, verily, verily is from the same word from which we get amen, which is what we say, so be it. Somebody says a good point, we say amen. We mean, so be it. I agree with you. Jesus is saying, so be it. So be it. I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Well, sin's a transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. What? An absolute objective standard. <laughs> And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now remember, these are the folks who said, we've never been bodged to anybody. But they are, they're in at least to sin. But when the son makes you free, then ye shall be free indeed. Then he said, I know that ye are Abraham's seed. But ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. Well, if his word had no place in them, what about the truth? It had no place in them. If his word had no place in them. Notice, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Now, he goes on down and pretty well says, well, do you know who your father is? And he's not God the Father. Do you see how Jesus, who is the truth, links up the words that are his words with the truth? And that's what we have right here. If we are unwilling to follow the absolute, objective truth of Jesus Christ in the words of truth, we cannot go to heaven. Have you ever watched, think of your own life maybe when you were tussling with whether you want to obey the gospel. And I promise you, you knew for a while what the Bible said you ought to do. Well, then why didn't you do it right then? Because you're fighting the truth. That's exactly what's going on. Fighting it either in that, well, that may not be what really the truth is, or fighting it in the sense of admitting that what it's shown to me is exactly right about me. What got Jesus killed? He told them the truth, and they saw the error in their lives. And they love darkness, that which is not truth, rather than light. <coughs> and they scurred just like if you turned over an old rotten log. You ever done that? You ever watch what happened to the little bugs that are under it? <laughs> They're running for the light. That's exactly what happens when the truth is preached to people who are in sin and they see their sins, but they don't love the truth. They run. They run just as hard as they can. Truth is what we need. Truth will even cause you to see things in your life you wouldn't see otherwise and cause you to see the deepest recesses of your heart where all sorts of motives and purposes can hide from you. Because 
reality is something sometimes we don't want to see about ourselves. And that tells us why there's so many people that have mental problems. They're running from reality. But if you become a Christian, you don't run from reality. You run to it. Because Jesus will show you yourself like nobody else can show you because he knows the truth about you. If you're not a child of God, we hope you'll receive with meekness the engrafted word because that's the way you receive the truth and that you will comply with its mandates to become just a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, by believing and obeying the gospel and being baptized in the Christ and living in the church faithful to the Lord according to the truth of the New Testament. And if you've erred from the truth as a child of God, the Bible says ye which are spiritual can have to do with converting that person. That is, to repent of your sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. That's what we're all about, to help each other go to heaven. And nobody can do it without the truth. I can't help you go to heaven without the truth. You can't help me go to heaven without the truth. Husbands, you can't help your wife go to heaven without the truth. And she can't help you go to heaven without the truth. And above all, you can't help yourself go to heaven at all without the truth. It all centers in absolute objective truth of God revealed in the Word of God. Now watch. That's why Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. So the truth will judge us. But it's the same truth in your Bible right now. And we're without excuse. So we ask you to come to Jesus if you need while we stand and sing.